In this section, we're going to talk about some of the applications of phylogenies and how we can use phylogenies to test hypotheses in different contexts. One example of such a hypothesis is to test whether dispersing larvae is equally as likely to evolve as non-dispersing larvae. So these are um, it's a group of mollusks that form a larva that can swim and some that form no larva that, that uh, allows them to swim. So if this, the, if um, evolving a dispersing larvae is just as likely as having a non-dispersing larvae, you would have a tree that looks like something like this, where going from non-dispersing into dispersing, which is in blue, is just as likely as going from the blue into brown. So any of these transitions will be equally as likely. On the other hand, if it is easier to transition from dispersing into non-dispersing, you will see that the branches start out with blue and then they turn into brown. So it is more likely that the brown originates from a blue than from a blue to originate from a brown. So let's look at an actual phylogeny to see C. And what we find when we compare the actual phylogeny is that it is more likely to transition from having a dispersal larvae into not having one so it is more likely to go from blue into brown than from brown into blue. Actually, there are no instances in this tree in which the organism didn't have a larvae and all of a sudden it started having one. And you can see why it would be easier to lose the larval stage than it would be to gain a complete developmental stage. There are also medical applications of phylogenies. And one of those examples is to track the origin of pathogens. So this can be used to understand the origin of viruses, the origin of bacterial infections, and we can trace them at different scales. So here, for example, this is the phylogeny of the HIV virus, and the HIV virus is a virus that mutates really quickly. And in this case, we're looking at the larger scale, where we want to know the cases in which the virus jump from another species into humans. And by comparing the uh, sequence, the DNA sequence, or the RNA sequence, this is an RNA virus, of all the HIV strains found in different species, we can see that there were four instances in which the virus migrated from another ape into humans. So this will be a case in which the virus from a chimp migrated into humans. This other strain, this is a different strain of the chimp virus, that migrated into humans, and here we have two instances in which the virus from gorillas migrated into humans, as well as these two other type uh, parts in which the virus migrated from a different type of ape. So we have multiple examples in which the HIV virus have migrated and made the jump from a uh, ape species into a uh, human. But we can also use phylogenies at an even smaller scale. And in the case of HIV, since it mutates so rapidly, it changes as when it goes from one organism to the next. And even within the same person, you can have multiple strains of the virus. So in this case, you have a victim affected with HIV, and you've collected HIV from multiple people around it. And you can see that from one particular patient in blue, the strains that that patient has are all closely related to the ones from your victim. Actually, the victim strain descends from the strains in that patient. So this shows you that this victim could only have gotten the virus from the person who has these strains in their body. And no other member in the community has uh, shares a recent ancestry with the strain in this victim. So you can see how phylogenies help us reconstruct evolutionary history in large times, the scales of time, but it can also help us understand the transmission of viruses with high mutation rates or even bacteria with high mutation rates at a very short scale of time.